All right, we are going to look at uh, dynamic cell activities. Um, these activities basically are going to focus on energy and enzymes. Um, there's a concept of biology that you should uh, be familiar with. So we know that living things do transform energy. Um, you might have learned in physical science that energy is the ability to do work, um, often measured in joules. Um, Basically, uh, what we'll look here is you've learned of two forms of energy, kinetic energy and potential energy, up until this point, and you may have studied some of the energy conversions that do take place. So energy, the capacity to do work, um, we are going to look at chemical energy present in organic molecules, and this is the direct source of energy for living things. Um, potential energy is stored energy, such as the energy in the bonds of the macromolecules that are stored there. Um, potential energy is, is food storage energy or energy at rest. Uh, there's also kinetic energy. Uh, kinetic energy is energy in action. So this would be when you take that potential energy or that stored food energy and you start breaking it down and turning that into maybe using that energy for muscle movement. So that would be mechanical energy. Uh, mechanical energy is a form of kinetic energy. In science, um, we measure uh, energy um, as calories, and calorie essentially, as a definition, is defined as the amount of energy uh, needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Uh, many people uh, often think of a calorie as um, the amount of calories that we see in food, um, and we associate that with the more calories that you eat, often the heavier you are as a, as a person. However, scientifically, um, calories is a lot more than just that. Um, calories itself is exactly this scientific definition here. So if we do look, um, we do see that uh, last year, you may have learned about this on a, maybe a, a swing. Um, when you talk about a swing in physics, it's a pendulum. And uh, there you see energy conversions between potential energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, and kinetic energy. Or here you can see here with the, the person walking um, up the slope. So as they're walking, um, that would be kinetic energy. When they get to the top of the slope and are resting, that's kinet, uh, potential energy. And when they come down the other side of the slope, that again would then be converted to kinetic energy. It's kind of essentially the same thing when you think of swinging on a swing. Um, when you're at the bottom of the sw swing, uh, as, as it swings in its, the, its angular motion there, um, at the very bottom point, uh, that would be the point to when you would first sit on the swing, you have potential energy, and then it would swing, swing, swing until you reach the highest point it could go when you kick your legs out. And eventually there, before you, you can't go any further before it starts to go backwards again. So that little pause there, that would be potential energy. And then as you swing all the way down through, Kinetic, till you reach that initial position, potential, and then you start to swing backwards until it reaches its highest point before moving forward. That would be kinetic energy to potential energy, and then as it swings forward again, that would be kinetic energy. So that energy conversion there, um, any energy conversion is what we see um, as we convert either whether we talk about solar energy to uh, potential energy or food, chemical energy, um, and then taking that chemical energy and using it as mechanical energy or a form of kinetic energy, those all involve energy conversions. And we do see that in the first law of thermodynamics um, and that it essentially is the law of conservation of energy. Um, thermodynamics is a study uh, subdiscipline of physics. And basically what the first law or the law of conservation of energy states is that energy cannot be created or destroyed but it can be changed from one form to another. And we did see that there in the diagram previously, and we'll study a little bit here in biology, starting with this chapter, and then get in, our, in, in some detail um, in our next two chapters. But with every energy conversion, some of that energy is lost because we don't live in 100% efficient systems. And during every energy conversion, uh, often that lost energy is heat. And the second law of thermodynamics is going to describe how energy cannot be changed from one form to another without a loss of that usable energy. Um, in this case, that definition that would come into play there is a thing called entropy. 
and entropy is a disorder or it increases. Um, so we, if we talk about the organization of the universe during every energy conversion, we increase disorder because of the difficulty um, to use all that energy. And often what happens is we lose that energy um, in the form of heat um, instead of having it being all converted into some work form. Um, so here we could see that relationship of taking that solar energy and one form being photosynthesis and how we lose some heat um, there. And then we see uh, autotrophs being eaten by heterotrophs, um, which would be the moose. And you have an energy conversion there. So uh, here we see both the first and second laws of thermodynamics being applied here. And it illustrates the relationship between an autotroph and a heterotroph. Um, which we'll see in photosynthesis and cell respiration. So when we talk about uh, uh, our energy molecule, the cell, that is going to be ATP. ATP is the abbreviation for a, a larger molecular name called adenosine triphosphate, um, which basically is the energy currency of cells. Um, cells are going to use ATP to perform nearly all activities in the cell. And there are two basic types of reactions that are going to take place in the cell as far as energy is, is related. Um, you can have an exergonic reaction, and in an exergonic reaction, you're going to have energy exit the reaction. So when energy exits the reaction, um, that means it will be uh, released. Uh, cellular respiration, our uh, upcoming chapter, is an example of an exergonic reaction. The reverse of that is an endergonic reaction. So uh, energy is going to enter the reaction. So you'll have an input of energy into that chemical reaction. And that, of course, would be uh, photosynthesis. So we'll look at endergonic and exergonic reactions. And we'll look at uh, energy reaction diagrams and where uh, those will fall as far as what uh, exergonic reaction looks like and what an endergonic reaction looks like in relationship from reaction progress to free energy, <sighs> excuse me, to free energy between the reactant and the product conversion. So here you can see adenosine triphosphate and the relationship between adenosine, adenosine triphosphate and its other form, adenosine diphosphate. Um, basically, the difference between adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate is adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, has three phosphate molecules, and adenosine diphosphate, ADP, has two phosphate uh, groups on there. So what happens is when that third phosphate group is released from ATP, you do get a release of energy, and ultimately uh, you get one free phosphate group then, and you get an ADP molecule. Um, ATP and ADP are like recyclable batteries, um, they are not consumed. They can be recycled back and forth by just simply attaching or detaching that last phosphate group, which would be that third phosphate group. So really the energy that we get, the energy currency from the cell is stored in that third, uh, between that second and third phosphate group in what is known as the terminal bond there. Um, you get about negative 7.3 or 7.4 kilocalories per mole of energy every time that bond is broken. So ATP does help couple reactions. Um, those coupled reactions occur in the same place at the same time. So you have energy releasing being exergonic reactions that are going to drive and energy requiring endergonic. So here we could see the, the muscle contraction. Uh, muscle contraction occurs when it is coupled to ATP breakdown. So what do enzymes play a role in all this? Well, enzymes are going to speed up chemical reactions. And enzymes are going to speed up reactions. Uh, basically, um, enzymes are protein molecules that function as organic catalysts. Remember, a catalyst is any substance that is going to speed up a chemical reaction. Often in chemistry, uh, fire as a source uh, serves as the catalyst to speed up a reaction. Um, without being affected by the reaction. So what we see here is uh, every type of reaction has this free energy, which is the energy, any type of energy that's available to do work. 
And then uh, you have this thing called activation energy, or the energy of activation, abbreviated E sub A. And the E sub A, or the energy of activation, is the amount of energy that's required to get that reaction started. So where enzymes play a role in is enzymes will come in and they lower that energy of activation. So it lowers the amount of energy that's needed to get that reaction going, ultimately speeding that reaction up. So if we look here, we could see a reaction pathway. Uh, we have two forms here. So down here on the bottom on the x-axis, we see the progress of the reaction. On the y-axis, going up and down here, we see the amount of free energy, the energy that is available. And then we have two single pathways here. In the blue, we have uh, when an enzyme is not available to do work. And you can see that the difference between here and here is the E sub A. So we lower that E sub A, that energy of activation. Um, what happens is when we introduce an enzyme into that reaction, um, that, that hump, so to speak, is lowered. And therefore, the conversion from a reactant over here to a product over here would occur much quicker. So an enzyme uh, basically uh, has uh, different parts to it. So some terms that you need to know related to enzymes is that, number one, enzymes are specific to the reactions that they catalyze or speed up. Um, enzyme names often end with an ASE ending such as catalase, amylase, um, uh, hectokinase, hexokinase. Those are all enzyme names. Um, some of them you'll hear about later on. Uh, substrates, then, are the reactants in the enzymatic reaction. So if we think of a chemical reaction, the substrate to the enzyme is the reactant in a chemical reaction. So the substrate is going to combine with an enzyme and it's going to form what we call the enzyme substrate complex. Um, basically, where the enzyme or where the substrate is going to bind to that enzyme is called the active site. And that's the area where the enzyme is going to meet that reactant and that conversion to a product will take place. Um, when, the, when the substrate binds to the active site, the enzyme kind of folds itself around the, the substrate itself. And that's where we come up with this induced fit model. It's a theory of how we think the enzyme-substrate enzyme complex works. So here we could see um, an example of a reaction. Um, this, of course, if we look, here we have a polypeptide. Um, that polypeptide chain would come in here, uh, bind to the enzyme. The, this area here would be the active site. So we have the substrate binding to the active site. And this entire structure here is the enzyme. Here we can see that an enzyme substrate complex, and basically when that is released then, we end up with our products, um, which would be, instead of a polypeptide, we now have dipeptides. Um, and then the enzyme, like, like uh, stated previously, is not consumed. So this enzyme can then go back in and catalyze another reaction um, until essentially the uh, right amount of product we need is there. So this is the enzyme substrate complex. Um, our next lecture that we'll look at is uh, some factors that will go ahead and affect the rate of activity of enzymes and talk a little bit about uh, a very minute, actually, let's do this now. Um, enzyme speed, uh, which is what we'll end with, is affected by these four things, the substrate concentration, temperature, pH, and cofactors. And we'll look at how uh, some of those things affect enzyme activity in labs. So we'll investigate that in our class. So you could write these down. So this is it, really, for our enzyme lecture. Um, our enzyme lecture has concluded. Um, we will discuss this a little bit in class and uh, do our investigation. And then we'll be done and move on to our next chapter. So thank you, everyone. And have a nice day.